really soft and very melodious. They should hear a kind of a balance between both the reading and the music. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'll read. This is called Description of Janmastami Leela from Ananda Vrindavan Champa by Srila Kaviraj Kanapur. Sounds like I'll be starting somewhere in the middle, but the way it's written, I'm kind of eliminating some of the preliminaries which describe the different personalities. I'll go right into the, the mood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Learning of Krishna's amendment of path appearance. The earth personified, feeling like a wife happily greeting her husband after long separation, immersed in unlimited joy. At that time of Krishna's birth, the general mass of people tasted the inner bliss that devotees forever relish. Auspicious signs abounded everywhere, as Vishnu's conkshell pan panchajanya opens in a clockwise fashion. Similar auspicious sacrificial fires glowed in all directions. Pure, gentle breezes brought a refreshing coolness like devotees who satisfy and sanctify everyone with their calm, sweet and affectionate behavior. The whole atmosphere became as completely purified as the heart of a devotee. The devotees once again found peace and prosperity in worshipping the lotus feet of Lord Hari. Fruits filled the jubilant trees, but the envious demons exhibited various inauspicious signs of degradation, such as rapidly aging bodies and symptoms of immemorial death. The desire vines of the celestial denizens seemed to be hanging in the air as if eager to produce fruit. At that time, all the directions became felt as pure and joyful as the mind of a devotee who has received the mercy of Lord Hari. Just as gems, mantras, or medicines can remove a poisonous disease from a body of a man, the advent of, Lord, of the Lord relieved the world from the contamination of material existence and the sinful effect of the demons. Happiness gradually replaced the distress in everyone's heart. The bodies of all creatures manifested extraordinary beauty and youthful vitality. Men felt extremely joyful and displayed virtuous qualities. Throughout the world, people behaved cordially and interacted amicably. Happiness twinkled in everyone's eye. At the end of the Dupara Yuga, which completely destroys faults and doubts, an auspicious, favorable, obstacle-free time appeared on the eighth day of the waning moon in the Bhadra month. Just as that sweet moment in Rohini Nakshastra, along with the good qualities of the moon and the auspicious conjunctions of stars called Ayushman, appeared in the sky to give shelter to gentle persons. As the living entities come out of the womb of his mother and the moon appears on the lap of the eastern direction, Yogeshwar Shri Krishna, the personification of complete bliss, appeared amidst great festivities. As the moon appeared on the lap of the eastern direction, which is like a beautiful bride, Krishna manifested the wonderful pastimes of his appearance out of his love and compassion for the conditioned souls. Due to austerities performed in previous lives, Vasudeva and Devaki received the opportunity to momentarily relish parental affection for the Lord 
Sri Krishna when he appeared before them in his form as Vasudeva. Thereafter, in fear of Kamsa, Vasudeva brought Vasudeva Krishna to Goku. There, the Lord appeared as Govinda before Nanda and Yasoda. His eternal parents, who have been smothering him with the sweet form of parental love since time immemorial. The four symbols of Vishnu, Sanka, Chakra, Gada, and Padma, adorned his lotus hands and feet. The flute, flower garland, and the kastubamani, although present within him, had not yet manifested. In fear of cruel Kamsa, Vasudeva decided to transfer all of his wives except Devaki to go cool. He sent Rohini to the house of Rajaraj Nanda. By the sweet will of the Lord, Yogamaya arranged for the seventh child of Devaki, Balaram, to enter the womb of Rohini. As a result, Balaram appeared in the home of Rajaraj Nanda before the birth of Krishna. Lord Hari, who is bliss personified, appeared in the home of Nanda Maharaj, the king of Vrindavan, for three reasons. To engage the self-satisfied sages in devotional service. To please the devotees by performing sweet transcendental pastimes and to relieve the earth's burden caused by the demons. At that time of his majestic birth, Krishna employed his inconceivable powers to appear in the body of eternity, bliss, and knowledge. Everyone in the maternity room swelled with joy upon seeing the Lord's exquisite transcendental beauty that looked like a creeper of beauty. Mother Yasoda resembled a lake of spiritual ecstasy in which a brilliant blue lotus of personified bliss had appeared. Neither the wind nor the bees relished the fragrances of that blue lotus. That unborn lotus was never touched by the waves of the modes of nature. Even Lord Brahma could not see it, what to speak of ordinary men. As Yasoda and her family members fell asleep in the maternity room, Hari cried beautiful like a newborn baby. His crying sounded like Mahavakya Omkara, announcing the auspicious arrival of his pastimes. Omkara is the transcendental vibration that had previously emanated from the mouth of Lord Brahma. When the ladies of Vrindavan heard the sweet sound of Krishna's crying, they woke up and ran to see the Lord. With the mellow of their matchless overflowing affection, they anointed his body. The natural fragrance of Krishna's body swelled just like musk. And after the ladies bathed Krishna with sweet ambrosia, he looked clean and beautiful. Then they smeared his body with fragrant sandalwood pulp. The presiding deity of the house sent a champak flower resembling the flame of a lamp into the maternity room to worship that ornament of the three worlds. With the strength of his little arms, delicate as tender leaves of a tree, Krishna made all the lamps in the maternity room look like a garland of lotus flower buds. The ladies of Vrindavan saw beauty Krishna, baby Krishna like a blossoming flower made of the best of blue sapphires or like a newly unfurled leaf of a Tamil tree. Krishna looked like a fresh rain cloud decorated with mustilak of the goddess of fortune of the three worlds. The ornament of the greatest auspiciousness lined his eyes. His presence filled the maternity world room with good fortune. Although a mere baby, Krishna had a head full of curly hair. To hide the unique signs of his hands, which can contain gold, fish, conch, the Lord folded his delicate petal-like fingers into his lotus palm. At that time, Krishna laid on his back with his eyes closed. Mother Yasoda awoke 
among the joyous chattering of the elderly gopis. Leaning over the bed, she admired her gorgeous son. Upon, but upon noticing her own reflection on Krishna's body, she imagined it was another woman. Thinking that a witch had assumed her form to kidnap Krishna, Yasoda became bewildered and yelled, Get out of here! You go away! Spontaneously, she cried out to Nishringadev to protect her precious son. Beholding Krishna's tender face, Yashoda showered tears of affection that looked like the offering of a pearl necklace. Yasoda saw Krishna's body as a mound of dark blue musk, softer than the butter churned from the milk ocean. Overflowing with nectar, his charming body appeared like the foam of milk, but being dark blue in color, it seemed like the foam was full of musk juice. Admi admiring the supremely delicate form of her son, Yasoda worried about his safety and feared the touch of her body might hurt his tender body. As she leaned over the bed, Mother Yasoda bathed Krishna with the milk dripping from her breasts. The elderly gopis instructed Yasoda how to caress the baby in her lap and affectionately pushed the nipple of her breast into Krishna's mouth to feed him. Due to Mother's in Mother Yasoda's intense love, personified bliss flowed from her breast as steadily streams of milk. When milk sometimes spilled out of Krishna's bimba fruit lip, red lips onto his cheek, Mother Yasoda would wipe his face with the edge of her cloth. After feeding her son, Yasoda gazed affectionately at him in wonder. She saw her child's body as made of dazzling blue sapphires. His mouth resembled red bimbo fruit, and his hands and feet looked like exquisite rubies. Krishna's nails shone like a precious gem. In this way, Yasoda thought her child was completely made of jewels. Then she perceived that his naturally reddish lips looked like bandukha flowers. His hands and feet resembled java flowers. His nails looked like maliki flowers. Yasoda then thought Krishna's whole body seems to be made of blue lotus flowers. He does not appear to be mine. After thus deliberating within herself, Yasoda became stunned in amazement. The beautiful, soft, curly hair on the right side of Krishna's chest resembled the tender stems of the lotus. Seeing the mark of Srivatsa on his chest, Yasoda thought it was breast milk that had previously sp spilled out of her mouth, his mouth. She tried unsuccessfully to remove these milk stains with the edge of her cloth. Struck with wonder, Yasoda thought this must be the sign of a great personality. Observing the signs of Lakshmi, a small golden line on the left side of Krishna's chest, Yasoda thought a small yellow bird had made a nest amid the leaves of a tamil tree. Could this be a streak of lightning resting on a rain cloud? Or could it be a golden streak marking the black gold testing stone? Krishna's delicate, leaf-like hands and feet, glowing pink like the rising sun, look like clusters of lotus flowers floating in the Jamuna. Sometimes Yasoda saw the curly, dark blue locks of the baby Krishna as swarms of bumblebees surrounding his face. Intoxicated from drinking too much honey nectar, the bees just hovered in the sky. His thick, beautiful blue hair appeared like the dark night. The two lotus eyes of Krishna looked like a pair of blue lotus buds. His cheeks resembled two huge bubbles floating in the lake of liquefied blue sapphires. 
Krishna's attractive ears look like a pair of fresh, unfurled leaves growing on a blue creeper. The tips of Krishna's blue nose, I'm sorry, the, Krish the tip of Krishna's dark nose appeared like the sprout of a tree, and his nostrils looked like bumbles, bubbles in the Jumuna, the daughter, the daughter of the sun god. His lips resembled a pair of red java flower buds. Krishna's chin rivaled a pair of ripe red jambu fruits. Seeing the extraordinary beauty of her son fulfill the purpose of her eyes and submerge Yasoda in an ocean of bliss. The elderly, the elderly Rajabasi ladies address Rajarananda, O oh, most fortunate one, you fathered a son. Previously, Nanda Maharaj had felt deeply aggrieved over his long-standing inability to attain a son. His heart was like a small lake that had completely dried up during the long, hot summer. But when Nanda Maharaj heard of his son's birth, he felt as if the dry lake of his heart had been blessed with a sudden downpour of nectar. The gentle sound of Krishna's voice removed all his grief and lamentation. Now he bathed in the rains of bliss, swam in the ocean of nectar, and felt embraced by the joyful stream of the celestial Ganga. Eager to see his son, Nanda's body thrilled with astonishment and waves of ecstasy as he stood outside the maternity room. Because he had accumulated heaps of pious activities, it appears that the king of Vrindavan was now shaking hands with the personification of pious deeds. Anxiously standing in the background, Yogamaya induced Nanda Maharaj to enter the maternity room. He rushed in to see his son, the personified seed of condensed bliss. It seemed that all the inauspicious of the three worlds now resided, I'm sorry, it seemed that all auspiciousness of the three worlds now resided within Krishna, the original cause of everything. Nanda saw his son as a perfectly charming person. The kajal around Krishna's eyes looked like lines of black creeper of beauty. As the very embodiment of Nanda's good fortune, Sri Krishna bloomed like a beautiful flower in the garden of desired trees. The Aparajita flower is compared to the body of the Queen of Vrindavan. Her son is like the representative of the Upanishads that are compared to the fruit of the desire creepers. By seeing his glorious son, Nanda felt that he had attained happiness perfection and the fulfillment of all his desires. Meeting the embodiment of bliss overwhelmed Nanda with immeasurable satisfaction. He stood motionless, stunned. His hair stood erect and tears flowed from his eyes. He appeared like a person carved in stone or a figure drawn in a painting. For some time, Nanda Maharaj remained in the semi-conscious state like a sleeping man about to awaken. Upananda, Sunanda, and other relatives felt extremely joyful upon observing the best of Brahmas perform the rites of purification for Krishna's birth. To ensure his son's welfare, Nanda Maharaj donated newborn calves to each of every Brahman, thus turning his home into a abode of Sarabi cows. These cows had gold and silver plated horns and hoofs and jewel necklaces adorning their necks. In addition, Rajapati Nanda filled the courtyard of their homes with hills of gold, jewels and sesame seeds. While Nanda distributed charity, the common denus, touchstones and desire trees lost their power to produce valuable items. Even the jewel production ocean lost their stock of jewels, and the goddess of fortune, the abode of lotuses, had but one lotus in her hand. 
The auspicious news of Krishna's wonderful appearance spread in all directions by the word of mouth. Delight danced in the heart of Nanda, his brothers Upananda and Sunanda, and all the other gopis. The gopis brought many varieties of delicious dairy products, such as milk, yogurt, butter, wet cheese, and hard cheese in jewel-studded pots. The pots were tied to the ends of bamboo poles with jute straps and carried on their shoulders. Bedecked with many precious jewel ornaments, the gopas appeared very handsome. They dressed in beautiful yellow cloth, defeating the brilliance of lightning, and held staffs topped with gold and jewels in their lotus hands. As the great ocean spreads its waves in all directions, the birth of Krishna filled the Rajabhasis with unbounded bliss. The gopas and gopis enjoyed the grand festival by happily eating and splashing each other's body with a mixture of yogurt, butter, milk, and condensed milk. The society girls visited Nanda Maharaj's home experienced more happiness than they have ever felt since their birth. Their minds saturated with joy and satisfaction. Hearing the delightful descriptions of Krishna's birth carried away the chariots of their mind and made them all abandon all other duties. They became possessed with the desire to see Krishna. Sparkling rubies hung from the necklaces adorning the society girls. Their diamond-studded armlets shone more beautiful than drops of crystal clear water. Their jeweled inlaid golden bangles boasted unparalleled elegance. For this unique festival, they took out some highly ornamental waist belts from their jewel boxes and tied them around their hips. The sweet jingling of the waist belts resting on the broad hips enhanced the beauty of these society girls. They attracted the minds of everyone with their bulky golden and arm anlets, loose hair braids and graceful gaits, which resembled the smooth gliding of swans. Their minds entered a state of enchantment as they gazed upon the captivating beauty of Krishna's transcendental body. To worship Krishna they brought golden trays full of auspicious articles such as fruits, flowers, yogurt, dervagrass, uncooked rice, and jeweled bedecked lamps. They covered the offering plates with splendid yolks, yellow silk cloth and held them in their soft lotus hands. Their jewels ankle bells vibrated pleasantly as they walked Beholding the astonishing beauty of the delicate baby, the society girls consider the purpose of their eyes fulfilled. They perceive Krishna's perfect birth to be like the appearance of the leaves of an important herbal medicine. Krishna resembled blue lotus floating high in the lake of his parents' affection. After the bestowing their blessings for Krishna's prosperity, they worship Krishna with fresh flowers and a constant shower of loving glances. With great enthusiasm, the society girls glorified Rajavari, Rajavishwari Yasoda since she had attained the essence of all good fortune by having Krishna as her son. Leaving the maternity world, the society girls entered the assembly hall of Nanda Maharaja's palace. Their face looked exceedingly beauty, beautiful as they sung melodious songs, which resembled the soft, sweet humming of bees moving amidst the cluster of lotus flowers. All the guests bathed in the nectar showered produced by their soothing sound. Overwhelmed with love, they filled then lotus palms with fragrant oil, turmeric paste, and fresh butter and started smearing each other's faces and bodies. They looked very attractive, with then smiling faces and glittering white teeth. 
Then red lips seemed more beautiful than red banduka flowers. This incredible display of elegance smashed the pride of the goddess of fortune of the three worlds. Carried away with joy over Krishna's birth, they fearlessly threw cheese balls, butter and yogurt at each other. One could mistake the white balls of cheese for hailstones, solidified moonlight, or white mud from the floor of the milk ocean. Then they showered each other with buttermilk, aromatic oils, and water mixed with turmeric. Cymbals, damru drums, biddies, and big drums vibrated auspicious sounds with high specific melodies. A celestial concert of precise poetic meters, proper rhythms, and, met and metrical compositions suddenly manifested. The musical assembly inspired the society girls to sing and dance in mirth and merriment. Though not good singers by the will of the Lord, they sang with great virtuoso. Then wonderful songs fill Nanda Maharaj's heart with joy. The combined vibrations of Brahmas chanting Vedic hymns, the recitation of Puranic lore, and the Panagirious prayers transform the ethers into Sabda Brahman. The joy of Krishna's birth celebration taxed the drains of Nanda's capital city as they swell to the brim with milk, yogurt, and other auspicious liquids. Soon river, rivers of this nectar flowed the streets of the town and permeated the entire atmosphere with sweet fragrance. Distinguishing themselves as birds, the demigod I'm sorry, disguising themselves as birds, the demigods descended, descended to Rajapura to happily drink the flood of nectar. The Rajabhasis decorated their cows with gold and jeweled ornaments. Then in great excitement, they smeared them with oil, fresh butter, and turmeric paste. Beholding Krishna in their hearts, these fortunate cows look like the essence of the earth's auspiciousness. The whole world resounded with their jubilant bellowing. Absorbed in the ecstasy of Krishna's birth, they forgot about eating and drinking. The festival drowned the gopis in an ocean of joy. After offering oil, vermilion, garlands, and utensils in charity to all the assembled gopis, Rohini, the wife of Vasudev, asked them to bless Krishna. Upon completion of the sacrifice, Upananda and the other relatives felt constant happiness while taking their bath. Keeping the king of Vrindavan in the front, Nanda's relatives offered opulent cloth, jeweled ornaments, tambula, garlands, and sandalwood pole to the guests. Then they humbly requested all in the attendance to bless that wonderful auspicious boy who had just appeared in Sri Vrindavan Dham. Krishna Janma Ki Jai. Very detailed and very beautiful description of the fraternity room as Krishna appears in, the, in this world. Mm -hmm. When Krishna appears in the heart and mind of a devotee or wherever he appears, everything becomes wonderful. All sadness disappears. All auspiciousness becomes prominent. Everyone feels unlimited peace and joy. So we honor the Lord, not only on this particular day, but continuously that please appear in my heart and make your janmastami my experience every moment. So that is the desire of the devotees. 
praying, begging, hoping, pleading, and working, please, Lord, enter my heart and mind, and everything becomes wonderful by your presence. And there's a beautiful description in the 10th canto of the third chapter where it describes that the entire atmosphere of the world, everything became so wonderful. The sacrificial fires of the Brahmins blazed so brightly and all of the constellations aligned themselves to, to show everyone that something auspicious has just, just appeared on earth. And even the demons, it says here, they became old and they aged real fast. <laughs> but the devotees were happy and people in general were feeling peace. So we want Krishna to appear in our life, in our heart. He's appearing in so many ways, but when he actually appears in your life in a very real way, in other words, your whole life becomes transformed within instantaneously as soon as he appears. So John Mastami is actually an opportunity to pray to Krishna. You're appearing in this world, but please appear in my heart also. And preparing for Krishna's appearance in the heart means cleaning the heart. As Krishna doesn't like places that are unclean. So cleaning the heart is actually preparing for him to sit on the throne of the lotus of the heart. The heart is sometimes compared as a lotus flower because it is the, the essence of one's life. The heart actually represents the love that the soul has for God. And that love is, cannot be described or even analogized by anything material. But for the sake of understanding, we compare it to a lotus because out of all of the beautiful things in this world, the lotus is the most attractive. To see a lotus flower, one immediately becomes happy and feels that they have found something wonderful. And Krishna is blue, so he's like a blue lotus. His hands, his fingers are like lotus buds, his feet are like lotus flowers with toes, the words are like lotus buds. And his smile is like a, a the actually, the main part of the lotus. It says that Krishna's body has 24 and a half lotus flowers on his body. <laughs> and out of all of the auspiciousness of the lotus, which is beautified by Krishna's transcendental body, his smile is the, is the most cherished and most sweetest of all. <laughs> when Krishna smiles, the entire creation becomes purified. <laughs> so this is a little bit about uh, preparing our minds and hearts for the moment when Krishna appears, which is considered to be right at the turn of the next day. The one moment, the first moment of the next day, Krishna appears. It's like the analogy could be used that the day of John Mastami is, is actually beginning at 12 o'clock midnight. But we're actually preparing our hearts and minds for that moment. And that appearance is like a transformation of consciousness, where the consciousness actually becomes full with happiness, and everything that a devotee ever desires for good fortune in life. So we pray to Krishna. And Krishna, as we were hearing from Prahlada Nanda Maharaj, Krishna is very kind. He is so kind that it's not possible to describe his kindness. 
His kindness is that all he asks is for a little attention, that's all. <laughs> we give attention to a lot of things in this world and a lot of people. But when we turn our attention to our Krishna, we are turning our attention to that love that's within our heart that will water that uh, creeper of devotion and make it sprout and land at the lotus feet of the Lord in devotion. And the devotee understands there's nothing else to achieve. <laughs> Everything is found at, with Krishna. As Prabhupada said, when you have Krishna, you have everything. <laughs> and he's available. <laughs> He's available. And he's available by one thing, love. <laughs> That's all. What is, how do you show love for Krishna? By making Krishna the most important thing in your life, person in your life. That attention is a feature of love because it's coming back to who we actually are. Everything in this world is ephemeral and it's just something that we acquired by being having a material body. But the love for Krishna is natural. It's eternal. And it's never it's never interfered with anything once that love develops. It becomes like a a raging river that is rushing to the lotus feet of the Lord. And Krishna is very lovable. Sometimes in this world we have to try to love someone. We want that love to come out, so sometimes we make an effort to bring it about in a, in a forced way. But with Krishna, it's not forced, it's natural. It just comes out naturally because it's our real, actual nature is to love Krishna. So, David Dharma Prabhu will uh, bring us to that moment of the appearance of Krishna with Kirtan. All right, Krishna. <laughs>